I'm Dan Hubbard, the health officer from Douglas County, and uh, we're going to be doing another of our Facebook Lives today. We're doing it now once a week on Tuesdays at 6 o'clock. So if you have questions, please send them to us at Facebook questions at douglaspublichealthnetwork.org. Uh, we had quite a few questions this week, so we'll go and do them first. But then if you have other questions, put them in chat and we'll get to them. Uh, as typical, we start from the worldview and then move our way down. And so most of the news is pretty good. So in the world, we're in an overall downward trend. North America, Europe, much of Asia is doing great. So the U.S., Canada, much of Europe, and much of Asia are down to less than five cases per 100,000 per day, which means that the pandemic is under reasonably good control. And that's a good news. So overall, good news. Uh, case are down and deaths are down. However, you know, I'm always looking at the little warning si signs in the corners to see if there's anything we should be worried about. And there are three things that I think we should be worried about. One is, you know, I've been talking for months now about my fear that Africa will heat up and serve as a source of lots of disease and lots of spread. And unfortunately, we're really seeing that now. So now five countries in Africa have sizable amounts of disease. And places like Namibia has a lot of disease. So unfortunately, this is the kind of pattern we've seen in the past where disease starts on a continent and then it spreads out among other places in the continent. So that's clearly something to look out for. The second thing is the UK, which has a very high rate of vaccinations. Over 80% of people have gotten one dose of vaccine. They're still locked down and really locked down. I mean, they're not opened up at all and they're continuing to see an increase in the amount of disease. And the UK worries me because if you've looked at the patterns in the past, the UK has had a problem, and two to six weeks later, we've had the same problem. And so the first peak, the second peak, the third peak, the fourth peak, uh, all of these were presaged by what was happening in the UK. So the last time the UK had a big spike, a few months ago, it was because the B117 got there, and, and, and just as predicted, four to six weeks later, we saw a big spike related to the B117 variant. So this is worrisome because their big spike now is related to the uh, Delta variant or the 617 or Indian variant. And they're seeing a lot of disease despite a very high level of vaccination. Now, most of the people who've been getting sick have been younger people. So the death rate has been not as high as it was before, but still a lot of people in the hospital, a lot of deaths. So that's the second thing that worries me. The third thing that worries me is there are three countries that have a very high vaccination rate and yet a very high disease rate. So Mongolia, Bahrain, and the Seychelles, all three areas have relatively high vaccination rates, have seen loss of disease. A little bit more uh, stuff about that today suggests that many of the vaccines they gave were vaccines from China, either from, there's a group called um, um, uh, San Farm and San Bio that made these vaccines that were used in those areas. And the protection doesn't seem to be very good from those vaccines. Now, those vaccines are a different kind. They're an inactivated virus. Now, inactivated viruses is actually the way we used to make a lot of vaccines. And, in, and indeed, almost all of the um, uh, influenza vaccines we make are inactivated. So what you do is you get a virus, you grow the virus, you inactivate the virus so it can't spread in people. So it's like a dead virus that you inject in people. And uh, it's the way we made uh, polio vaccine and other kinds of vaccines along the way. It's a very tried and true method, but doesn't give you very high levels of immunity. And it appears in this case that these people do not have high levels of immunity. And when faced with the contagious Delta variant, that they can have a breakthrough with at least that vaccine. Now, we still think the mRNA vaccines, the Moderna and the Pfizer, still are really quite good against all the variants. Not quite as good as the ancestral forms, but they still seem to be pretty good against some of the variants. So again, the world is overall doing well, but three warning signs, Africa heating up, the UK having a lot of disease despite lots of vaccination, and then uh, three countries with high vaccination rates with the Chinese vaccine, which seem to be having loss of disease. Uh, in the U.S., cases continue to fall. We're now at uh, about 3.4 cases per 100,000 per day, a, a nice low rate. There's no real hot spots. Missouri, Louisiana, Arkansas, that little stretch there along the Mississippi do seem to be kind of struggling. This is worrisome because these are areas which are relatively low vaccine. But 
overall in the country, the deaths are also falling. We're averaging now less than 300 deaths a day. Now, it's a little amazing that we say, oh, less than 300 deaths a day. It's still a lot of deaths. Um, and still overall, we've had 600,000 deaths. Now, I'm sort of a student of history, and I look back over all the wars that we've had, and very clearly the number of deaths that we've had in the, uh, from COVID are more than all of the combat deaths in wars fought by the U.S. since 1900. So all of the combat deaths was about 300,000, 600,000 people have died of this. Now, obviously, people in war die of other things, and the total number of deaths is slightly higher than the 600,000, but still, this is a lot of deaths, and in perspective, all of those war dead who we, who we really mourn and really lost, this death is in that, in that range. So it really is a significant thing. In Oregon, uh, slowing down again, we had the lowest number of cases in an entire year today, 74 cases. Now that may have been a little bit in, a little bit of problematic reporting, but nonetheless, a relatively low number of cases. Douglas County also, which has, has seen a little spike over the last month, is starting to see a decline. We had a quiet weekend, a few quiet, quieter days now, but we're still not less than that five per 100,000, which is kind of in the range we want to be, and eventually down to about the one per 100,000. The outbreaks we're seeing are, again, almost all in unvaccinated people. Uh, we, are see, we have one outbreak at a residential care facility where there were people who were vaccinated. We're not sure what went on there, but for otherwise, generally, people who are unvaccinated are not getting sick, and people who are vaccinated are getting sick. Um, uh, we're also seeing spread in other workplaces. So one person in a workplace gets it. If other people are not vaccinated, pretty much everybody else has gotten it. So we really, really, really are working hard on getting people vaccinated. We've got a lot of other interesting stuff today that we'll get to. Just a few other things. One is Oregon is nearing the 70% vaccinated. When Oregon gets to the 70% vaccinated, there's going to be a relaxation of many of the restrictions. When I last checked this afternoon, we're about 40,000 uh, first doses away from that 70%. And if things go well, we should hopefully hit that by next week. We're having a big vaccine event this Saturday. Maybe this Saturday, actually, we'll hit it here in Douglas County. And that would be a good thing. Next week, they're going to have the drawing for the million dollars for a vaccinated person. And then a drawing for some uh, college money for kids less than 18. So, again, this weekend at the fairgrounds from 9 to 1. So if you know anybody who has not been vaccinated, 12 and above, please have them come and we'll get their vaccine done. Um, all right, let's get to our questions here. Here we go. Uh, not quite. <laughs> um, so one of the things that was discussed, and while we're getting to the questions here, was about whether um, the vaccine will interfere with fertility. And this has been one of the myths that's been out there for which there's absolutely no data. I mean, there are some myths out there that start on, on a little bit of data, some case reports, and then people move from there. In this case, there is no data at all to suggest that this is going to have any effect on fertility. And uh, fertility is a hard thing to measure, right? So you have to have Two people have sex and have a baby, and you, it's a rate. Clearly, it's not a, something that happens every time, so it takes a long time to determine fertility. But at least there's no, there's no new data to suggest that's going to be there. They looked at sperm counts of men who, before and after vaccination, there didn't seem to be any change. So Paul asked the question, so if Oregon reaches a goal of 70% of the state eligible having received the first dose of vaccine, will the lifting of restrictions be applied statewide? And the answer is yes. It will be applied. Um, it will be applied statewide. It seems it would not be appropriate to allow counties that have not achieved the goals to be allowed such loosening of restrictions. 
the restrictions, all of those things are really complicated because it's a, com it's a combination of public health measures and political realities. And I think this is where political realities and public health restrictions meet. If you were going to say, for example, in the counties that you're not you're going to have these restrictions until you reach 65 or 70 percent, there are a bunch of counties that will never get there. And uh, it's a little hard to know how you could politically continue these measures when you're probably not going to get there. So it, it's, it, is, um, uh, it is complicated, uh, politically complicated. Public health-wise, it's very clear, but it's, it's complicated politically. And the story is we elect these people to make decisions, and that they do the best job they can at making those decisions. Uh, are we expecting to see more disease in a place with low vaccine rates? Yes. And in fact, if you look at the map of where the hotspots in, in Oregon are, pretty much follows those areas that have low vaccination rates. So it is not would not be striking or not shocking to see that those places with low vaccination rates live with a higher rate of disease than those places that are high, more highly vaccinated. So are we collecting data on the specific vaccine people received for the breakthrough case? We did that this morning. Joyce, um, it turns out that there were some of each, and just in about the proportions that we got it. So the most people in this county got the Pfizer vaccine, the most breakthrough cases with the Pfizer vaccine, second most was Moderna, second most in back breakthroughs were with Moderna, and the fewest people got J&J. &J. There, there were some breakthroughs with each. So the breakthroughs appear to be low. Now, breakthrough rates are very hard to calculate, but vaccine effectiveness rates, that is the attack rate in uh, people who were vaccinated versus the attack rate in the people who were not vaccinated. Um, you know, when we look, it looks like the vaccine has been uh, well above 90%, the last around 95% over the last six weeks. So the vaccine is very effective. 95% is very high. Uh, there's almost no other vaccine we have that's that good. So measles is about that good, but mumps and rubella not quite that good. Hepatitis B clearly not that good um, uh, because people don't always make antibodies. And so um, I think that the, the vaccines really do work and they work well. So uh, someone says that the fully vaccinated person had a breakthrough case of COVID-19 and then gave blood, would the antibody testing differentiate between the antibodies from the vaccine and the antibodies from the disease? And the answer is yes, it would, uh, because the vaccine just has spike protein. So when you make antibodies against the uh, vaccine, you just have spike antibodies. Um, when you get the disease, you make antibodies against both the spike protein and the nucleocapsid protein. And so when they give blood, they test first to see if you have spike antibody proteins. If you do, then they check it again for nucleocapsid. And if you have both, then you likely have the wild disease. If you just have the spike antibody, uh, antibody, but not the nucleocapsid antibody, then you likely got your immunity from the vaccine. So as you know, I give blood on a very regular basis. And my last two donations had exactly that result. So um, Karen says, is there any progress being made on an antiviral pill that could help fight COVID-19? Well, you know, I've been talking all along from the beginning. The way we got rid of other viral pandemics hepatitis C, HIV was not through a vaccine, but was through the development of a very effective anti, uh, antiviral drug. Antiviral drugs are hard to make. They take a long time. So I lived through the beginning of AIDS. So when I was a first new pediatric patient, one of my first patients was this little girl from Haiti who was very, very sick and we did not know what was going on. And she was and she was wasting away, and she was sick, and her mom was sick, and we couldn't figure out exactly what was going on there. And then we, we heard about this new disease called HIV, and we traced it back, and she'd come from an area of Haiti where there was disease. And indeed, uh, she was one of the first pediatric patients in the country with uh, HIV. That was before we even had a name for it. And uh, she subsequently died. And since then, I've cared for about 20 kids with HIV. And early on, this was just a just a horrible disease. Um, kids did badly. They, 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 just, they just did not survive well. And then we got the antiviral drugs and they did better. The first antiviral drugs were not very good. But now we have incredible antiviral drugs for HIV. And so not only are there are fewer pediatric cases, but anybody who has HIV can live a long, happy life. Look at Magic Johnson. 
I mean, I remember back early on, he, he was diagnosed, and yet he's been very well because of the antiviral drugs. So antiviral drugs work well, but they take a long time to develop. For any of us who live with people we know have hepatitis C, you know, hepatitis C has been just a nasty disease for a long time, and over the last five years, we've developed very effective antiviral drugs that work almost 100% of the time. And so antiviral drugs are really a key, and one of the big lacks we've had is we did not put nearly enough time and effort into antiviral drugs um, because we know they can work. They take a long time to develop, but they can work. And we put a lot of money in vaccines. Well, the money in vaccines was well spent, but we didn't put very much money into antiviral drugs until just this week when $3.2 billion was put into the antiviral drugs. I don't think it's going to help for COVID. I think by the time we develop these, um, COVID's going to have changed enough that it's probably not going to make a big difference. But I think the antiviral is the way to go. And I think having a bunch of antivirals on the shelf ready to go so that when a new thing comes up, you can find which one of those works and have it already done, ready, ready to manufacture so that in the next pandemic it could come. So we know, for example, with flu, that those like have flu work really pretty good, pretty well. And uh, imagine if we'd had something like Tamiflu early on, it really would have changed this. So I think now we're putting time in there, but I don't think it's going to happen in the near future, but hopefully it'll be there for the next pan for the next pandemic. Then there's all the talk about these other things, which are not really antiviral drugs that might have some effects. So we've heard about hydroxychloroquine, heard about ivermectin, we've heard about fluvoxamine, we've heard about pepsid all things that people notice little hints that they might work. And so I have a bunch of people who correspond with me on a regular basis. They seem to love to write me about that, you know, we should really think about ivermectin as, as, as the go-to drug. Uh, there are some little, little nuggets which are kind of interesting about places that use more ivermectin than others and did better or worse than others. Uh, you know, and, it, and, it, and stuff is intriguing, but... There's a lot of intriguing stuff in medicine all the time. So again, I've been doing pediatric for 40 years, and every week there's another article about, oh, we have found the cause of SIDS. And then you wait six months, and it's like, oops, not really. So in medicine, there's a lot of early interesting stuff that never pans out. And so, and so the fact that these interesting things in ivermectin are great but what you need to do is you need to do a well-controlled, randomized controlled trial, and that will tell you if it works. So what happens in many of these things, people come out and say, oh, you know, we looked at six consecutive kids with a certain thing, and they all had this. This must be the cause. What you do then is some other study then looks at 100 consecutive kids, and they say, yeah, we didn't really see it. And so what you need to do is you, these hints are important because of the way we think about the trials that we're going to do, but then you need to have the trials. And unfortunately, with ivermectin, we don't have any good trials one way or the other. Hydroxychloroquine, I think we have good trials that it doesn't work. Fluvoxamine, we have one trial that's intriguing, but no trials that it works. So antivirals would clearly, clearly be one of the things that we should have done more early on, but somehow, somehow we missed that. I think we're doing it now, but it's probably not going to help us in this pandemic. Um, <clears throat> um, so the question is, does COVID-19 cause permanent brain damage? There was an interesting study, not a not fully peer-reviewed, not published widely yet, that looks at the brain by CT scan, and especially the gray matter, which is the thinking part of the brain, in people who have had COVID versus other controls. And it doesn't look good, actually. It looks like the people who have had COVID lose some gray matter in different parts of the brain, <coughs> especially in the parts related to taste and smell, which shouldn't come as a great surprise because loss of taste and smell is there. However, I always am cautious about correlating what somebody's brain looks like with how well it works. You know, in general, it helps to have a good-looking big brain in there. In general, that's better than having a small shriveled brain in there. But what we see is looking at the brain doesn't always tell you, right? We have some people who are brain dead whose CT scan looks normal. And then other people who are um, 
uh, sharpest attack and your CT scan looks terrible. So I think you have to take that with a grain of salt, although it really is worrisome to see CT changes because in general, a big full brain is better than having a small and shriveled brain. So does any, do any of the COVID vaccines cause birth defects? None that we know of. Birth defects, though, are really um, the hardest thing to know, right? So when people want a simplistic description of what it is to, to build a person, it's, it is the most complicated project you've ever had that has to proceed exactly on time can never take a day off for weather or anything else. And there's all of these different subcontractors working on the brain and the gut and everything else all at the same time. And the fact that any of us come out on time looking reasonably normal is, is just totally shocking um, because so many things are happening at once. And birth defects are very much dependent upon when you actually get sick. So people who are old enough can remember about thalidomide, a, a, a drug that was given as a, a sleeping pill kind of for pregnant women. And if you took it at the very wrong times, it caused limb defects. You had to take it at the very right time though. If you took it two days earlier or two days later, it didn't seem to have any effect. And so that was like during the time they were putting on the gable to your house it interfered with what was going on, and that happened two days earlier, two days later, didn't seem to make a difference. But in this case, it really made it incredible difficult. And so, you know, birth defects are, are going to be one of the biggest concerns because you obviously don't want to have your baby with birth defects. There is absolutely no data to suggest that it should cause birth defects. In the study, there were, uh, there were, they've looked at people who were pregnant and there were no birth defects. But again, you'd have to have enough people get the vaccine at every day of the pregnancy to know for sure that it didn't. And so all of the data out there suggests that it does not cause birth defects and the recommendation is go ahead and do it. But, you know, if we as a society said, well, this is important enough to do, we've not ever said that 100% of the people need to be vaccinated. So the woman who was pregnant didn't get vaccinated. Everybody around her got vaccinated. The disease would still go away. And so you know, people with really weak immune systems, people with a history of bad allergies, people who were pregnant, if that small group of people decided not to get vaccinated, the rest of us did, um, we would not be in where we're at now, right? We would have over 90% immunization and we would have very few cases. So the person says that there's a thing called mothertobaby.org. I looked at that, it looks perfectly logical. It has most of the data that I've seen from uh, the CDC, from ACOG, which is the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and the Society for Reproductive Medicine. Those all seem fine, and all of those suggest it's perfectly fine to get the vaccine, and I would agree with that. But if you really are nervous, you know, if the number, if people in the first trimester didn't get vaccinated, we'd still have, there's only, there's only at any one time in all of Douglas County, 300 people in the first trimester. That means that there's still 111,000 who are eligible for the vaccine, so that would be okay. So someone says, does the Portland VA have problem counting their immunizations? So the problem is with the VAs is not that they have problems counting their immunizations, it's they have trouble reporting their immunizations to state registries. So the VAs have different rules about reporting their immunizations than do other places. So when my clinic reports vaccinations, they report the vaccinations to a place called Oregon Immunization Alert and they provide the names and addresses of the people who got those vaccines. So later on, you wanna find out, oh, I can't remember when my last tetanus shot was. You can look it up in the Oregon Immunization Alert and get it. The VA proudly on their website says that we'll tell about vaccines, but we don't share your names or addresses. Well, obviously without the names or addresses, it's really difficult for us to count those, those vaccines. And that's what the issue has been. And the issue is just the VA, a federal agency, does it differently than all of the other local agencies. The tribes are also a little different uh, to their incredible credit. The Cow Creek not only does it to the feds, but they also are entering it manually to the, to the state. So that's the trouble. And, and again, the Portland VA 
It's not trouble counting it, it's trouble reporting it to the state registry. So um, do other county total up their positive case in noon? Well, most other places aren't giving the same kind of information we are. So we, from the very beginning, did our cases using the very best and latest and up-to-date information. And our information is almost always better than the state's, and not surprisingly, because case will come in, the people from the hospital will call me day or night, we'll talk about the case, we'll do all those things. So we knew about the case way before the state does. And early on, when there weren't very many cases, you know, two cases today and no case tomorrow, or three cases the next day, we wanted to know about the cases as, we wanted to tell people about the cases just as soon as we could. And so we published them every day at noon and they were totally accurate until 11 o'clock. Over time, the numbers are, are very accurate. We could report them some other time, we can look into that doesn't really really do it. The question is, are, who's doing it correctly? I think we're doing it each in our own ways. I think both are correct, but they are slightly different, but not really that, in the end, that different. Now, the one difference is reporting deaths. When Douglas County reports a COVID death, this is a death where the person both had COVID and their death, after I review the records, is very likely due to the COVID. So early on, there was a concern like, oh, everybody who dies, they get COVID tests and they say they died of COVID when they really died of a car accident or they died of uh, you know, a heart attack. And so we look at every death and, we, and Douglas County only reports the deaths where the bro both person both had COVID and they died related to COVID. Now, n not always COVID was COVID is, is never the cause of death, right? So COVID in and of itself doesn't ever cause anybody to die. It's the thing that COVID causes. So COVID causes pneumonia, which leads to respiratory failure, which leads to death. COVID causes a bleeding problem, which leads to a stroke, which leads to death. COVID causes renal failure, which leads to other metabolic problems that leads to death. So COVID is always the, when the ones we report is there. Now the state reports deaths where the person both had COVID and died, even if COVID didn't exactly cause it. So you'll see that there's a slight difference in the death reports. And again, we think our numbers are the most trustworthy. And I would look at, if, if I had one place to go, go to the Douglas County numbers. Uh, we could switch to a midnight count, but again, then you're gonna miss the cases that we were get reported early in the day, right? Because we're not going to report, we're not going to do our, our update at midnight. We're going to do our update at noon. And again, if you do midnight the night before, you lose all those cases in the morning. And sometimes there's as many as 10 cases in the morning that come in. So I think we're going to keep doing what we're doing. So this is a long question here, and I'll, I'll paraphrase here. So we have a mom who's got a, who's got a kid who's three years old, really at severe risk, has already had pneumonia. And so people else in the family have been vaccinated, um, but there are other kids in the house who are too young, and sort of this three-year-old is too young. We've tried uh, to keep my son isolated and follow strict masks and safety guidance as a family, and because of his special needs, he can't wear a mask, and thus it's been pretty hard. So the question is, when is it safe for my son to go in public, like grocery shopping, church, attending s soccer games and track meets? Do we have to wait for the vaccine for him or 70% of our county vaccinated? His doctor doesn't have an answer. So I'm gonna give you an answer. And so the story is that as you, people have been watching this, never I'll never say this is perfectly safe and this is perfectly risky because even the riskiest thing that you could do, place where there's a lot of people with COVID, you not vaccinated, you don't wear a mask and you go to a crowded party, Still, that doesn't mean you're gonna get infected. In fact, most people wouldn't, but still a lot would. And then even in the safest situation, there might still be a breakthrough case. But for the, for the sun, there will be some things that would really be much safer. So outdoor activities like the soccer games and track meets, much safer than an indoor activity like a small church group. So a small church group inside, 20 people in a small room, poor isolate, poor ventilation, that would be riskier than outdoor track meet. Again, we've seen very, very, very little transmission outdoors. Uh, shopping, 
tends to be big, wide spaces, very good ventilation in grocery stores. So grocery stores are somewhere in between. So outdoors, really quite safe. Grocery shopping, safer. A closed thing like a church meeting or a, or a school meeting or something would be, would be more dangerous. Do you have to wait until 70% are vaccinated? Again, there's no magic number about this. It's not like when 70% of the people get vaccinated, the disease will go away or the disease will be rampant until we get to 70%. But as we get more and more people vaccinated, we'll have fewer and less and less disease, which is kind of what, kind of what we've seen. So I, I would, you, everybody comes up with a different risk threshold. And it sounds like your risk threshold is pretty high. And so, so, I'd start with some of the, I mean, like anything we do when we, we start doing things a little more risky, right? When we start driving, we don't start driving at night in the rain. We start driving in the daylight hours slow and then increase our risk. So what you might do is to go to the sibling soccer games and track meets, which should be very safe. See how it goes. If things are, if it's well tolerated and you're feeling comfortable with that, then you might do the next step up, which might be grocery shopping and to do that. Uh, so a 16 year old has been vaccinated, but what can she do with friends that don't pose a risk to my son? So again, being being vaccinated is a, is a great protection, but not a hundred percent. And so it's hard because it's hard to tell the 16 year old, hey, you can't go to a sleepover at a friend's house because you've got this uh, sick brother at home. And this is this is. Um, and this is and this is really hard. My granddaughter is sixteen, and and it would be hard to tell her that she can't go with friends uh, for somebody else's sake. Now, the very best thing is that her friends could get vaccinated, and if her friends were vaccinated, then her chance of catching the disease from her friends would be very low. Um, so, again, the very best thing would be if she could convince her friends, and her friends may not want may not think they they need the vaccine, but. When we do things in life, we're not always doing them just for ourselves, I hope. I hope we're doing some for ourselves and some for others. And so when I get vaccinated for a disease, some of it is to protect me, but some of it is to protect the people around me. When I give blood, it's not really for me, but it's for the other people around me. And this is some of what we need to do as a society. And again, the very best thing we could do for your three-year-old is to build a fortress of protection around them. And you've already done a really good job in this last year by isolating him. But hopefully we can, we can expand that fortress now by getting other people around him uh, vaccinated. Um, you know, and does she need to quarantine away from her brother, take other safety measures? Uh, that's a that's a that's a really really hard one to know. One of the things I would say that if anybody in the family gets sick, that they do stay away from the little one. We don't think there are going to be vaccines for the little ones until probably for a three year old, probably until next year. So Lane says, are most of our new cases here a variant? Yes. Is it the Delta variant? No. When we look today, the the three variants that we're seeing mostly in Douglas County are the B117, which is the alpha variant. We're seeing some of the gamma, which is the P1, and we're seeing some of the South uh, Southern California ones, which are not variants of concern, the 427 and the 429. But again, mostly the B117. And this is the concern, because when I look at the UK, if, they, if you look back in their November data, December data, they had almost no B117. Over the next three months, they had a lot of B117 and a lot of cases they went down. Now what they're seeing is almost all, the, they have almost no one B117 left. It's almost all the Delta variant and they're seeing another rise in diseases. And there have been some predictions that the B1, that the Delta variant or the Indian variety is going to come here and that would be a real concern. So Bruce says, how many breakthrough cases have we had here? Um, Okay, so these are the numbers. This is the number over the last six weeks. Over the last six weeks, we've had 742 cases of disease. Of those 742 cases, 718 were not fully vaccinated, and only 24 were fully vaccinated. So we've had, over the last six weeks, we've had about 24 
breakthrough cases. And again, most of those, many of those breakthrough cases related to one single outbreak for which we don't yet know if there was a variant involved. So again, over the last six weeks, about 24 was a very low number. When you look then at the attack rate, so 718 of about, and this is just going to be rough, about 718 out of 70,000 people who are not fully vaccinated got sick. So 718 out of 70,000. But then of the 40,000 that are fully vaccinated, only 24 out of 40,000. So 24 out of 40,000 versus 718 out of 70,000 gives this vaccine efficacy of 95%. So get your vaccine. So Penny says, I know of two people who were fully vaccinated. They were over two weeks after the last dose and still had positive results in testing. Um, and again, as I said, we've had one outbreak that's had a fair, that had a good number of breakthroughs, and it could be because of the variants. We have sent out the variant analysis on that, but the variant analysis is slow, so we're not going to know for another week or two. Uh, a couple of possibilities. One is just bad, dumb luck that happens. The second is that for whatever reason, one person in that group was just very, very contagious. So we do know that with COVID, that some people are not contagious at all. They don't even spread it to their family. Some people are moderately contagious and spread it to two to five people. And then other people are just crazy contagious and spread it to many others. So we're not sure if there was a super spreader in this group. We're not sure if a variant was involved or if it was just luck. Um, so what level of concern should we have if the state opens up, even though we're not at close to 70%? So again, the most effective thing we can do is get people vaccinated. Masks are good. Distancing is good. Closing restaurants may help a bit. But really, the most important is to get the vaccine. I think we need to be a little concerned. Um, I think we need to be a little concerned. Uh, so Diana says, is Douglas County still at 53%? We moved up a little bit. I think the last number was like 53 six. So, but we're still in the low 50s. And this even includes all of the VA doses, the, our best guess at the VA doses and our best guess at the Cow Creek doses. So we're still at 53 six, which is still low, right? Uh, the state is around 69% and there's some other places since we're less than 70%. There are some places in the state that are well above 70%. Yeah. So Bruce says, can I discuss why we have any restrictions at all? Whenever anyone, everyone over 12 can get the vaccine, plenty of supply, and it's effective. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, why don't we just get on with life, right? Why don't we just say, look, we've got a vaccine. If you want it, you can get it. If you don't want to get the vaccine, well, just, just deal with it. And if you get sick, you get sick. And let's just, just move on with life and move past this. And there's a, there's a really, 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 really strong sentiment to do just that. And in fact, much of the country has gotten there. That, hey, there's a vaccine there. If you want to get it, get it. It's free will. If you want to get it, great. If you don't want to get the vaccine, it's your choice and, and do it. And, and that's certainly a strategy. And I have mulled that around in my head. It's a little disappointing, right? It's a little disappointing that you have effective treatment and yet people choose not to get it and they live with the consequences. And... This is how we do other things, right? There's dental care out there, and yet there are some people who don't have good dental care, and they run around with terrible-looking teeth. We have lots of smoking cessation stuff out there. We know people know smoking is bad, and yet people continue to smoke. And so is this just going to be in the same way that we know that there's disease out there, and if people get it, they, they get it, and it's their choice not to have gotten the vaccine. And that may be how we as a country choose to deal with this. To me, that would be really disappointing. Right? I mean, we didn't say the same with polio, right? We didn't say, well, you know, we, it's, the, the iron lungs are opening up and uh, these, these crippled kids with braces, well, if they get it, their parents should have gotten vaccinated around them. Uh, and so Bruce is probably right that this is where it's going to go. But I think for me, that's terribly disappointing when we have the perfectly good uh, we have the perfectly good, safe, and effective vaccine uh, here. And so who knows what's going to happen with this. You know, one of the concern, um, so w one of the concerns for um, 
this though is that smoking won't change, right? So smoking causes whatever disease it has, and it's not like smoking is gonna. If you let people smoke, it's gonna affect really people who don't smoke. The problem with this is, if this disease continues to spread and continues to have lots of unvaccinated people, you could now have a really nasty variant. So a really nasty variant which could evade the vaccine and infect all of those people who already have gotten the vaccine. And so that, that's, a, that's a difference from some of the way we've approached smoking, right? So it's not like we could say, well, at some point, smoking is going to change. So even those people who are not smoking are somehow now going to get lung cancer. In this case, it really is an issue. So Jessica says, why is only 18 and over being counted as a percentage of vaccinated when everyone over 12 and over is eligible? Why aren't they being counted? So this is, this is one of the great confusions of this, of this pandemic. And because there are so many different ways to, to uh, convey the vaccinated rate. So there are, for those of us who remember our fractions, the numerator, the number on top, the denominator, the number on bottom, there are at least six different ways to calculate both the numerators and the denominators, and then 36 different ways to put them all together. And so on the top, that is the people who are vaccinated, does that mean that they have gotten one dose a vaccine? Does that mean that they've gotten fully vaccinated, which is two doses of Moderna or Pfizer and one dose of J&J? Or does it mean that they're fully vaccinated from the public health standpoint, which is two weeks after two doses of Moderna and Pfizer? Some people would include people who were previously uh, infected in the last uh, 90, 120 or 180 days as part of the numerator. So that numerator can be all kinds of different things. And then the denominator um, could be uh, people, all, the whole population, which would actually be the right way to calculate herd immunity, the population that's currently eligible, the population over 12, the population over 16, the population 18, or the population over 65. And so there are so many, many, many different uh, variations on this. And people use these interchangeably without explaining this. And this is my bugaboo. I wrote this fairly pointed letter to the state about eight weeks ago saying, we are killing ourselves because people hear that the rate in Douglas County is, is 40%, that it's 50%, that it's 60%, that it's 65%, all of which are correct with the right numerator and denominator. And for the poor people who don't live this every day, you have to have one understandable way to do it. So the feds came up with one understandable way to do it, which is people who'd gotten one dose of vaccine, people over 18 who'd gotten one dose of vaccine, the denominator being people over 18. And that's what they chose to do. And actually, I applaud them for picking and sticking with the one numerator and denominator. Doug, uh, Oregon has confused me because, for example, the 65% goal we're supposed to reach is of people 16 and above, a little different from the feds, 18 and above. And, and, the, and the state interchangeably, and it's not interchangeable, uses fully vaccinated versus one dose. So that's why it is because President Biden said our goal should be that 70% of people 18 and above will have had one dose of vaccine by the 4th of July. Are we going to get there? I don't know. Uh, we'll probably get there, but we probably won't get there by the 4th of July. So Anna says, I've recently been diagnosed with breast cancer, Graves' disease, heart disease. Oh, darn. My health is very poor. Should I still get the vaccine? Well, I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, should you get the vaccine? I think every recommendation is that you especially should get the vaccine um, because with these underlying diseases, your risk of, of getting very ill should you get the disease is high. And unfortunately, with those things, your risk of being very sick and dying is high. And your risk from the vaccine is, doesn't appear to be any higher than anybody else. Now, you may not get as good immune response, but especially people with underlying conditions really should get the vaccine. We have seen that the vaccine has been incredibly effective at preventing uh, hospitalizations and deaths. 
So especially for somebody with those things, I would definitely get the vaccine. So Veronica says the vaccine is so safe. Why hasn't the FDA approved it yet outside of emergency use? A very good, very good uh, question. So typically what happens is the, that the uh, FDA requires for something to get full approval, that is, that is full approval, ready to go, ready to sell, you have to have two well-conducted double-blinded studies, which they do on these, and then you have to have six months of follow-up after that. So you remember these studies happened in October, November, got approved in December. So we're just now coming up with six months of follow-up data. And when they get that this month, I think we're actually going to see full approval. And I think these vaccines will show to be incredibly safe and incredibly effective. And uh, those will get approved. So where are we in the process of vaccinating those under 12, Deborah asks. Um, uh, two studies that I've seen come out, they look good, but again, we have to see all of the data before we're going to go ahead and bring this down. Now, the concern is with different ages, is like with everything, there's a risk and benefit to what goes on. So if you take somebody like me, an old guy, my risk of getting the disease is pretty high and the benefit of the vaccine is pretty great. Right, so at my age, my risk of getting sick or dying if I got the disease was pretty high, and thus the small risks from the vaccine are much less than the risks of the disease. So it's all in favor of me getting it. When you talk about a 15-year-old, I mean, their risk of dying of the disease is pretty low. Their, disease, their risk of getting hospitalized with the, from the disease is pretty low. And now we're starting to see more cases of this myocarditis, especially in young young males and so the 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 risk benefit is really quite different for me that i've not seen much myocarditis in 65 year old guys and my risk from disease is high versus a 15 year old so um i don't know i don't know what's going to happen this week there's going to be a discuss about risks and benefits for kids under for kids in their teens and we'll see what they decide again it's very complicated and, and there's some really, really smart people on the panel. So I have a friend going to Portugal for two weeks, and I want to visit her after she comes back, which is great. Should I wait two weeks after she gets back? So again, we're talking about safe and safer still, so that um, if she's vaccinated, uh, that's safer. If you waited two weeks after she gets back, that's safer. Um, Far and away, the, the, the safest thing to do would be for her to get vaccinated. Um, and again, waiting two weeks after she gets back would make it uh, safer. So, uh, but, but again, that's, that's, that's still a very small risk if she's vaccinated. Now, if she's not vaccinated, I definitely would not visit until two weeks after she got back. So, which Douglas County community has the highest vaccine rate? Nail says, it is... Drum roll. It is. Uh, it is Reedsport. Um, so Reedsport's got the best vaccine um, rate in the county. Uh, a couple reasons. One is the Lower Umpqua Hospital has done a great job working with lots of different partners in getting vaccines out. Uh, Reedsport does have an older population. The older population has had a somewhat higher rate, but uh, Douglas County community they have done great. Um, uh, Roseburg also is pretty high. Um, especially in the Melrose area. The lowest areas in Douglas County have been down in, uh, down in the Riddle, Glendale area, so our Tiger team is focusing on that area there. But in general, the best, uh, best county, best area is, uh, is uh, Reedsport, and Lower Umpqua Hospital should be very proud. Okay, well, let's go through a few other things. Um, uh, so we talked about the, the thing where they looked at people who'd had sperm counts before and after the vaccine, and, this, and the vaccine does not seem to affect your sperm counts. Uh, one of the questions we get a lot is whether, um, is whether the natural, in, natural immunity is better or, or is better than what you get from the vaccine. And in some cases, natural immunity is better than what you get the vaccine. So, for example, with, uh, with um, uh, measles, um, both are very good, but slightly better if you've had the disease 
Uh, in other diseases like Hib, the vaccine is better than the natural disease. So the uh, Danish looked at this, relatively small country, great medical records so they could check everyone. And what they found was the vaccines were in the 90s um, among the whole population uh, having had the disease in the in the 90 to 180 days beforehand was about 80% protected. So pretty good, but not as good, but only 50% among seniors. So national immunity is good, pretty good, and, and seems to be pretty long-lasting, but it's not as good as the vaccine. Um, another thing that we have noticed recently, or we've noticed through this whole thing, is that birthday parties are our big bugaboo. Oh my goodness, I cannot tell you the number of birthday parties that have been associated with outbreaks. And think about this. So birthday parties, at least until the summertime, tend to be indoors. They tend to be a lot of people. They tend to be singing and blowing of candles. So they tend to be all those kind of things which tended to spread disease. So one, this clever researcher looked at people and they looked at the chance of when in the year they would get infected. And you would think that, you know, my birthday's in February, that I could get infected in January, February, March, kind of, kind of the same as everybody else in the community. But what they found was that people who had birthdays were much more likely to get infected in the two weeks after their birthday than at any other time, suggesting that there's something about your birthday that made you get infected in the next two weeks, and they postulated this was the. Um, they postulated that this was the birthday party effect, and indeed we've seen a couple of cases just like that. Uh, we talked a little bit about the Chinese vaccines, and again, the Chinese vaccines are inactivated virus viral vaccines. So you grow the virus, you kill it, and then you inject it in people. That it should not work as well is not shocking, right? Because you don't inject that much virus into people, so there's not that big an antigen load for your body to make antibodies to. Unlike the mRNA, where you inject a little bit of mRNA, but it now tells the cells to make lots of copies of the spike protein, and so your body makes a lot of immunity to the spike protein, so that they would, so that the mRNA vaccines would work better than the inactivated virus is not surprising. But what is sort of sad is with really high levels of vaccination in the Seychelles, in Bahrain, in Mongolia, they're seeing a lot of disease. And so I'm a little worried about that. So Dale Ann said, how successful was the chainsaw vessel? It was, it was incredible. So we gave a few dozen vaccines, but a few dozen vaccines is longer, is more than we had before. What was most amazing is to watch these people with the chainsaws. These men and women who were doing this chainsaw art are just incredible. They, that they could visualize what's hidden inside that big log and the bears and the eagles and the other kinds of things are just amazing. So I would suggest if you've not been to the Chainsaw Festival, please go next year and watch these amazing people carve amazing things. I can barely chop down a tree with a chainsaw, and yet these people can make amazing art out of it using chainsaws, grinders, blow torches. It really is amazing to watch these artists at work. So if a person has COVID, how long does immunity last after recovery? So the good news is we know that it, it lasts 90 to, at least 90 days. We, right, we, only have, we only have about uh, 15 months worth of experience less at least 90 days and it seems to be now pretty good for 9 to 12 months so for 9 months or 12 months after what your immunity seems to be pretty good in that 80 to 90 percent we've had a couple of people who had the disease early on they went to one one notable person went to New York to work as a nurse got sick as a nurse and came back and then got sick again here so we think uh, it's, pretty, it's really good for 90 days, for three months, pretty good for six to nine months, and we're going to continue to look at data to see afterwards. So I think natural immunity probably has some, but how many people have natural immunity in Texas County? It's pretty low. So one of the ways you know that is the Red Cross and others look at blood samples and they look to see who has antibody levels. And again, the numbers in Douglas County are only about 6% 
who are who about who are six percent who have immunities after natural infection. So if you, even if you add that to the fifty three percent or so we have otherwise, we're still only about sixty percent of people who are immune. It's not enough. Uh, that still leaves so many people out there who are unvaccinated that this could really spread. So, um, so how long should a person who has had COVID wait to get the vaccine? So early on, they suggested that you wait 90 days. The reason for that is your risk of getting the disease in 90 days was low. And they wanted to save the vaccine for someone who, who didn't have any immunity because they hadn't yet been infected. So when the vaccine was scarce, that made all the sense in the world. Now the vaccine is anything but scarce. It's, it's everywhere. And so now the recommendation is you should wait until you're through your isolation period and then get the vaccine. We do know that people who've had the disease and then get the vaccine have the best immunity. So getting the, getting the disease is pretty good immunity. Getting the vaccine is really good immunity. But getting the disease and then getting the vaccine is like super duper immunity. So if you really want to be super duper immune, Deborah. Go get your vaccine when you're done with isolation. All right, that's what I got. So, and it's 6.56, so it is time to go. So again, Dr. Bob Danhofer, the Public Health Officer, Douglas County, will do this again each week. I really loved all the face questions at Facebook questions. And again, I'll take tough ones. So if there are like naysayers out there who want to ask some tough questions, I am, I'm, I'm down for, for tough questions and I'll be happy to do it. We always try to be respectful of people. We never try to ridicule anybody's belief. We really want to go ahead and support people, but I really would like people to get vaccinated so we really can put this in the rearview mirror. So Bruce asked, well, you know, vaccines out there, why don't we just get on with it? What would be great is if we could really get on with it and only have a very few cases so that the variant couldn't spread. Because right now, if the variant got here, the variant could spread. What I see is I follow the, the English story by towns Many of these towns have 70, 80% coverage, and yet when the 617 hits their little village, it just blows up, and they've got all these uh, cases. Now, again, the cases are mostly in younger people because, again, many of the older people are vaccinated, but it really hits the younger people, and they get, back, and they get, and they get sick. And when I look in Douglas County, I mean, we have some really young people in the hospital. I mean, we didn't see this early on, but let's see if I can find the number for you here. Um, but we're seeing some really, really young people in the hospital. When we look today at our hospital numbers, um, you know, we have, so we look by birth dates. So we have people with birth dates in the 90s. We have people with birth dates in the 80s. Um, you know, we have some, we do have some, some older people, but most of the people are younger than me. And I consider myself to be pretty, or to be pretty young. So again, th th there is a, there is a worry there. So send your tough questions. We'll always do them. Hopefully, we're going to answer them respectfully and 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 fully. And again, I I have no vested interest in any of the treatments or anything that goes out there. I just would like to get to a point where I'm not having to talk with families that have had bad disease and the people are really still pretty sick. So a lot of these people reach out to us later on. And when we hear about them, they're, they're still really, really sick. I, I, I know one, one fellow is really the picture of health, right? So this is a, a person who owned a business, um, big hunter. You know, you'd say, That's, that, that, that guy looks great. Got COVID and just crashed. And died, and so at a time when you'd be expecting that he would spend time with family, he'd be he'd be uh, enjoying his grandkids, he'd be cutting back on his work so he could do more hunting and more fishing. He's dead, and so that's what I really want to avoid, and that's why I would love people to go ahead and get vaccinated. But again, we'll do this again uh, next week, same bat time, same bat channel. Uh, see you then. Be be safe and be kind. Thanks.